Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here with Dr. Fatima Denton. She's the director of the Institute of Natural Resource in Africa at United Nations University in Ghana. Fatima, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I, uh, Fatima, I, I just, by way of background and history, uh, we met at a dinner at, in the Ivory Coast. She was a panelist in an INET event at uh, the Mo Ibrahim Annual Convention. And I just thought you were so illuminating, both at the dinner and on the panel, that I turned to Camilla and Fulashad. I said, this person has to be a member of the Commission on Global Economic Transformation. And I'm, I'm glad you accepted our invitation. And under the leadership of uh, Nobel laureates Mike Spence and Joseph Stiglitz, uh, there are very, very focused plans on the priority of development in Africa. And, uh, and I'm very happy because I know you will make a very significant contribution. Today, we are talking in July of 2020, amidst the pandemic, and there are many, many issues related to African development, the pandemic, climate change, how would I say, the unmasking of ideas. I uh, saw that you had given a lecture called the Alexander Kwapong Lecture, and the title was Nature Speaks, where Africa and independent thinking come together. Such a promising title that you chose, uh, first of all, reinforces my enthusiasm for working with you on the Global Commission, but also as a member of uh, this podcast community. And uh, so I guess without trying to, uh, how do I say, direct traffic, I'm curious, what have you seen? What do you find that is uh, troubling, illuminating, creates potential possibilities? What have you seen you didn't like? What have you not seen that you would like to urge the world to embrace? Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, well, I think, first of all, what I have seen, if we're talking about our immediate context um, of the COVID-19 world, um, the mm -hmm. world seemed to be have been more or less imposed on us by by a very sort of virulent um, virus, um, and that seems like it's not going anywhere, to, you know, too soon. Um, it is is a is a solidarity, I think, that that I have never seen, um, you know, in a long time. I probably haven't seen it, in, you know, before. Um, I think that um, nations nations are talking. Um, nations are talking to each other. Uh, people are talking to themselves and to each other. Um, and, you know, solutions are being, you know, identified. Um, and I think that's, that's actually um, the way it should be. Um, because no one country can sort of insulate itself within its borders and i think there's one thing that this pandemic has actually revealed is the the, the fact that we we do live in a global village um, and therefore this being a global village a lot of the issues that we will have to grapple with uh, must be done in that way that is inclusive um, that draws people closer um, and that we can't really silo the responses. I mean, the pandemic also has shown us that the problems are not just one dimensional. They're not um, health related only, you know. There are social problems, there are economic problems. Um, there are problems that are related to environment and how we look after this planet. Um, so I think that that's something that I'm sort of coming out of the pandemic in a way, um, thinking to myself that, I wish we can take this very inspiring solidarity to many of the negotiation processes that we have been involved in. I wish we can borrow some of the, the principles of, you know, enlightened self-interest 
um, and we can take them along with us when we're negotiating the Paris Agreement because we've had 25, 26 odd years of negotiations and we, we don't seem to have come you know, um, as far as we should. Um, so those are some things I'd say that I, I, that I find exciting and, and hope that it's a, it's a lasting legacy um, of the pandemic. It's, it, it has come at a cost, but at least we, we know that solidarity is possible. Um, and that, you know, it's when we, we do connect with each other, uh, no matter where we are, that the true solutions emerge. It's an interesting uh, thing that you say in light of, particularly in the advanced economies, there is so much which you might call recoil from globalization, the kind of populist nationalism, yeah, uh, trying to we might call unlink. Uh, I, I find this rather haunting myself in the context of the need for climate change, uh, where the scope and scale of transformation in places like India, the African continent, China, and even the United States uh, doesn't just affect your own nation; it affects everyone. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think, and the other dimension, though, I, I understand is that as Joe Stiglitz and Danny Roderick and our commission are working on, the notion, let's say, started from the Treaty of Westphalia mm-hmm. of the nation state and the tools it has in order to protect and enhance the life of its citizens take on a very, very different tone in a globalized nanosecond financial transfer, information transfer world. So I, I think there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of need to re-envision mm. some of the architecture. Yeah. But I, but I agree with you that it, it it's not time for nationalist retrenchment and decoupling when the possibilities from collaboration are both essential and beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it might still happen. We might still see nationalism rear its ugly head. I mean, that's still within the possible. But it is my hope that we would not go back to sort of that, um, you know, um, nationalistic approaches that we, we, you know, protectionism, you know, we, we, we look inwards um, and to the um, to the detriment of the of the rest of the world, um, that that is still I think um, a real possibility. Um, that as nations recover, they are so focused, might even say so obsessed with their recovery and how to arrive at that. Um, that only that matters, um, and they go back to those sort of nationalistic tendencies that we, we see nationalism, um, um, you know, at the very start. Of, for, for a number of years now um, that we have been seeing, so that's still that's still there. Um, but my hope is that this this has been at least um, a pandemic that has brought people together. So hopefully that togetherness, that inclusiveness, will will continue. Let's let's talk a little bit about the uh, how you say illuminate the impact of the pandemic on the African continent. People have said to me, uh, because of the younger demographic, that the the dangers may not be quite as uh, severe, just given the nature of the virus and how it's affected uh, older people. Uh, but in, in places like South Asia and Africa, the infrastructure, the health systems are not quite uh, so fully developed. And, and I'm... I don't have a great deal of insight into what's happening in Africa. Well, how, how do you see what's taking place? Yeah, I mean, I think to a large extent, when the when the pandemic struck, there was a sense that it's for the first time this is this is somebody else's problem. You know that that was the wider perception, at least from where I sat. That was what I got, um, and I think as things continued, um, there was a realization that this is a global issue. Um, and certainly the action and the, the, the prompt action that many African leaders took, I think um, demonstrated that they were certainly not 
um, waiting for the pandemic to sort of, you know, um, um, basically arrive on their borders. They wanted to find ways of ensuring that this was not going to be too big a problem for them to resolve. Um, so I, I think that there's been um, a decisiveness um, and a willingness to act on the part of African leaders, and I think that they they they, they acted quite um, you know in in a in a in a hands-on way um, to really see how they can contain it. So all the borders, the restrictions, um, the lockdowns, etc., that was all done because they know. Uh, that the health systems that we have in place is, is not fit for purpose. Um, and that if the pandemic did happen in the way that it was forecasted in Africa, then, you know, um, this would be, um, you know, um, a really grave um, situation um, because, you know, there was a sense that thousands and thousands of people would die. Some even went as far as saying millions of people could die, you know. So there wasn't there wasn't any uh, a, a sense of what might happen, but there was a sense that um, decision makers or policy makers did not want to be caught unprepared, and therefore they had to really take the first preemptive strike to make sure that they were doing at least baseline preparation, you know, baseline prevention, um, to ensure that they were not caught unawares. Um, so. In a sense, I think the, the saving grace in Africa is, has been the young population, because as you know, this is a, a continent uh, where, you know, most of the people are below um, 25 or 60%, I'd say, of the population are below 25 years of age. Um, so it's a dynamic, vibrant, um, you know, sort of um, continent. Um, and I think that that has been probably one of the reasons why fatalities have been quite low. Uh, but we are seeing numbers, uh, numbers are sort of um, going up. You know, there's been quite a hike in countries where I am, in Ghana, for instance, um, in South Africa um, and in other parts of Africa. Um, so so we, we still haven't seen the full extent of the, 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 the pandemic and how it might unfold in this part of the world. Um, and as you said, um, the, the, the infrastructure that we have is nascent infrastructure and sometimes quite weak. Um, and not often in the strategic places where it needs to be, health, education, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that's where the worry lies um, on the fragility of that infrastructure um, and the sense that, you know, if it does hit... Um, really badly, then, you know, governments and people would not be able to cope. And uh, how would I say, do you think there is any advantage from the onset or the acceleration of the pandemic here being later than, say, in China, Asia, United States, Italy, and France? Uh, are there lessons to be learned, uh, how would I say, from the mistakes these other regions have made? Um, I, I certainly think so. I mean, th there, there seems to be um, a great deal of um, consultation that's taking place between African leaders themselves and in their different regional organizations. Um, it is certainly the case that ECOWAS, which is the you know West African community of um, community of West African states, um, are talking to each other. So a lot of the decisions on border closure, lockdowns, or even reopening the borders, I think, are made at that level at the level of ECOWAS. Um, and I think they've got their eyes peeled on what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, Africa and Europe have had long years of history together, you know, colonialism and all of that. But now there are also market relations between these two continents. So I think there's generally a sense that, you know, they need to keep their eyes peeled. The pandemic is having a huge impact on the economy. Um, there are many economies that are seriously affected and, and, and almost on a limb, um, especially those economies that are, 
their revenue base is very much dependent on, you know, hydrocarbons. And you've seen what's happened on the world, you know, in, in, in the sort of global arena where the oil prices have come down. Um, so I think from that perspective, they are, they are sort of um, talking to each other and they are um, quite in tune with what's happening in Europe. Um, and they're learning from that. Um, I certainly think that a lot of the the, the, the um, precaution about you know the, the sanitation and, and the hand washing and all of those things, um, I think were accelerated. Um, they were actually very thorough. Um, the whole issue about mask, where the wearing of mask, I actually felt that those were lessons that we we done in Africa. Uh, more so than anywhere else, uh, because I felt that, um, you know, uh, people in England, for instance, were not as rigorous on the mask wearing than they're here. In Ghana, you can't go into stores if you do not wear masks. There, there is a notice outside that say, you know, no mask and no entry. So I, I actually think that um, th there was a, a heavy sort of um, response um, that was put in place just because they wanted to be in, uh, maybe a few steps ahead of the rest of the world um, because they did not want to get in a situation where they are in so much bother that they, they are unable to address the situation um, with the pandemic. Um, so I think that, yes, there were some, some lessons um, that we learned um, from the rest of the world. I think, uh, I guess the the sense that i have in the in the west is that there is this tension between protecting human life and spurring the economy mm. and by spurring the economy we take more risks of of the loss of human life because of the proximity of people in the workplace and, uh, and this is obviously tied into the moral um, conflicts related to inequality because those people who have less means are the ones that are forced out into taking the risk in the workplace. Yeah. But this, I think this raises a very powerful tension because we, I, I was trained as an economist, and we were taught that the economy is a tool, is a means to the end of human well-being. Yeah. But we're now seeing, in, in the United States in particular, a lot of pressure on the part of elected officials to resurrect the economy at the risk of an acceleration of deaths related to COVID-19. I know you have a much more, what you might call, supple and broad education, both with regard to the arts and literature and, and the natural sciences uh, than a traditional economist. And I wonder how you see the ideology of economics falling short or breaking down. Hmm. And, and what kind of, how, I don't know what I would say, how you would reconcile this tension between economy and humanity. Yeah. And, and I guess what I would add to that is that the whole nature of the credibility and trust in governance hangs in the balance. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I, uh, I would agree to a large extent with um that observation. Uh, I think the, the Ghanaian um, head of state, state said it right. He, he said, Nana uh, Kufo Ado, he said that we, I mean, we know how to bring um, the economy back to life. What we don't know is how to bring people back to life. Um, and I think that in a sense, there was this sort of um, dichotomous situation that most um, leaders and countries found themselves in, you know, because it was obvious that economies were going to be badly bruised um, after this pandemic. And there was a sense that uh, you could not sacrifice um, the economy 
Um, but at the same time, they were keen to see how you can protect life, how you can, you know, support infrastructure that will then also, um, you know, especially health infrastructure that would then um, um, serve as an, as an anchor for people um, in, 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 in regions like this, where, where those infrastructures tend to be quite weak. Um, but that said, I think that this, this dichotomy is often a false one, at least from my perspective, because I don't know what you would do um, for an economy if you do not have people at the very center of that economy. Um, I think that I think in any economy you do really need people, you know, um, you know, for for any form of production, people are important, and I think this is why we are now talking about economies that are inclusive, because we have seen far too many examples of rapid growth um, and rapid growth whereby we are measuring everything in terms of GDP per capita, but we're not taking people along with us. Um, I think in many countries in Africa, con countries have been growing, you know, up to a two-digit figure. Uh, but, you know, Africa is also known to be one of the most unequal sort of regions in the world, you know. Um, and so, you know, I, I fundamentally believe that our economic model as it stands today needs to be revamped and rethought and reimagined. Um, because um, this growth at all costs, you know, um, you know, sometimes doesn't really make sense. Um, are we going to sacrifice that for welfare and well-being? Um, you know, and um, what are the potential risks when we do that? Um, in some parts of Africa, people felt that restrictions were were quite stringent. Some would even say draconian to some extent. Um, and to a large extent, maybe that would have helped in, serve, in you know, saving lives and you know, protecting human welfare. And so in many countries, you know, even though these are countries that are highly indebted, um, governments have actually gone out, out to provide a, a certain degree of safety nets, you know, providing food supplies to those that are, um, you know, on the periphery, I would say, um, the poorest. Um, and, you know, utilities, we all know how energy poverty is a huge problem in Africa. Um, so in countries like Ghana, for instance, you know, government has taken some steps um, to providing some support in terms of electricity um, supply um, so that people do not have to worry about um, paying for something that they may not have the resources to do. Um, that goes also for water. Um, and water is important um, in this pandemic because, um, you know, sanitation is key to how you could protect yourself from, from, the, from the virus, you know. So I think those things are all being done. And, you know, I'm sure it has an economic cost. Um, but at the end of the day, I think those things have to be balanced also for the, the greater welfare um, of people. The... Uh thing that I, I find most most troubling right now in in the context that you've just described is the role of governance because I, I use the phrase that you use putting people first in the United States in particular but in many countries large corporations and wealthy individuals have an extremely powerful influence over what I'll call social design. Mm. In the United States, the need to raise very large amounts of money for the uh, for re-election, over a billion dollars to run for president, uh, I think refracts the system which we call democracy mm. in ways that make it very difficult to put people first, we can put a few persons first <laughs> who are the most wealthy and powerful. But the question, I, I guess, is also without broad-based representation and governance, a lot of the dimensions of sustainability, social, social sustainability, 
cannot be achieved. Yeah. And at this point, the despondency among many people with regard to governance, mm -hmm. it's not as if it's the government or the market. People view in many ways the government is captured by the market or the, those who succeed in the marketplace. And so in restoring faith in our future, what do we have to do with governance that allows us to put people first and create a broad-based prosperity and security for, men, for many people who inhabit the earth? Yeah. Well, um, that is a tough one, Rob, in, in many ways, because, you know, many of us have been sort of um, talking about the the importance of um, revisiting the social contract um, and ensuring that um, you know not the government governments take a back seat, but you know they they actually enable people to um, you know. Um, better themselves and to really prosper, but in a way that doesn't just have an economic value. You know, you, you talked about social sustainability. I mean, and in a way, one of the things that this pandemic has also revealed, especially in Africa, is the value of kinship. You know, the value of, I mean, even though people had to social distance, you know, but... Um, you very much rely on others, those sort of communal relationships uh, that um, that you that you that you are dependent on when you're sick, when you um, when you're not well in 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 a context like this, um, and and where and places where governments cannot get to, places where health systems, um, you know, are, are absent, um, people have to rely on each other. Um, so, so in many ways, I think, and in many parts of Africa, it hasn't really been a question of government or market, um, because many people, you know, have come to rely on themselves. <laughs> um, there are many cases where government support, you know, at, at, a, at times when it's even dire, when you need that support to draw on as part of that social contract, it is it is absent. It's not there. So, I mean, I can see how when you juxtapose that in the North and what is happening um, in the industrialized countries and what is happening here, um, to some extent, I'd say there is a slight difference, although this part of the world is not also immune to market considerations. Um, governments... Uh, have their eyes peeled on that, uh, and and as we speak, are, are thinking about how they can revive their economies, and and some some of that might mean that a lot of the gains that they had made in terms of containing the pandemic might be lost, because they they do realize that they can't continue um, keeping people confined and locked down for a long time. So at some point, uh, the economy and economic and market forces will win. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think that, you know, I, I come back to those two words about, about social um, sustainability and about, um, the value systems that we have in place, the trust, um, that we can, we can sort of, um, you know, um, draw on, um, you know, trust in ourselves, but also in our, in our family relationships that we have in the communities that we have fostered and, 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 and cultivated. Um, and those are all the sort of um, systems that we draw on um, in such cases. Um, like I said, in, in, in many parts of Africa, you, 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 you would want to have governments supporting you in terms of cure and prevention, but that's not often there. Um, so I think that this, um, for me, has been a very much uh, also a lesson on, you know, how we have to 
um, find ways of um, harnessing those um, social support systems um, because that's 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 actually at the core of our humanity and and when we lose that we lose everything yes yes that's well said uh, you are an expert in the realm of natural resources and obviously the question of climate and particularly in the equatorial regions around the continent of Africa or southern Asia are uh, how do I say, places that are most affected by the rise in temperature. We've been talking a little bit now about governance and representation and putting people first. The, the question I guess I'm asking is, has the pandemic diminished the urgency to address climate change? because we're spending all kinds of fiscal resources on, on sustaining the economy, the banking systems, et cetera, mm-hmm. using up our fiscal capacity, I would say, is the, is the way some people would describe it. Yeah. And then uh, on the other hand, are people displaced from work, staying home, becoming weary in the sense that a profound change in the tra- in the energy structure that's necessary to address climate change involves very different patterns of living, patterns of commerce, etc. Yeah. So uh, some would argue that the these factors will slow down the vigor with which society would embrace this very important agenda. Yeah. Others would say We've shown that the system isn't right. The need for collective action, the need for international, global collective action is essential so that we don't exterminate life on Earth. And because what you might call the rigid ideologies of the market or whatever have been washed out to sea by the pandemic, Mm. we can now with a call to action, rise to this challenge with more vigor than would have been possible before. Yeah. Yeah. How how do you see the balance here? And and what what is your vision of how we will achieve a sustainable environment and and sustainable resource economy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a a tricky situation though, Rob. It, It is really tricky. Um, so, you know, I often like to, when I'm asked about this question, think about it in a normative sense, whereby I hope, my hope is that the vigor that you've talked about, that the same vigor is, you know, revitalized to, in order to sort of, you know, fight climate change, because it is a fight. Um, and and we, we have come too far to sort of let our guard down. Um, but there is a tendency, there might be, a, I should say, a tendency that, you know, on the political scan, the radar of most policymakers, they may not join the dots. They may not see COVID-19, climate action and all of these things as a kind of seamless. And we need to have a joined up thinking whereby we say, how do we use this pandemic as an exercise in really um, getting our economies back to back together, but in a way that moves away from some of the unsustainable practices that we have seen in the past? Um, and it's a it's a real it's a real uh, dilemma to some extent. Um, and I have a sense that the, the climate change. Is a, is a residual problem. It's actually even, even more than just a residual problem. It, it's actually very prominent. Um, but um, my sense is that it hasn't gone away, um, but on the radar of most policymakers, it might not be as prominent now as it needs to be. Um, and in reality, one could say that 
you know, planet, um, climate change has been called a, a planetary emergency. And I do feel that where Africa is concerned to a large extent, I would say it has been in an emergency ward for a long time on, on several issues, on climate change, on energy poverty, and now there's COVID-19. Um, so, so I think that the sense that we can, we have to inject some vigor in our thinking, in our practices, in our plans of building back better, uh, we need to look at the situation as one of opportunities. How do we think through um, using renewable energies as a, you know, the mainstay of our economies? Um, it is true that Africa is in a in a situation where many countries um, are very much reliant on hydrocarbon resources, um, and those resources are being stranded um, and might have to be left in the ground. Um, and leaving them in the ground might have some consequences for these countries in Africa because their their revenue base is dependent on the foreign exchange earnings. Because most countries in Africa. Even the most rich, if you take Nigeria, Angola, <clears throat> um, Algeria, <coughs> Libya, uh, maybe not so much Libya these days, but these are countries that are very much reliant on hydrocarbon resources that they export. They don't add value, you know. So, so they they have no, you know, they they have a very limited number of even oil refineries. Um, so most of what they do, what they export is crude oil that's been exported to, to other parts of the world. Um, and so to some extent, they have been shortchanged for a long time out of resources that they could have had had they, you know, um, put in place all the relevant infrastructure. So that's a dilemma because the world is now moving away from these fossil fuel resources and many African countries um, uh, uh, are basically reliant on these resources, including those that have just discovered oil and gas. Um, but they have to realize that this might be a, a crash course uh, to start thinking about green trajectories, green solutions, um, looking at, as I mentioned, renewable energy. The, the continent has you know, a lot of potential in solar energy, wind energy geothermal, you know, and, and taking advantage of that, um, even with all the, you know, because these are not also the perfect choices. They, they have, they, there are problems related to storage and capacity when you talk about solar energy, etc. cetera. Um, but they are solutions. They could make up a menu of solutions. Um, and I think that's where countries need to be. They need to start looking at what is it in their arsenal of solution that they can tap into. Um, and how do they then build back better um, with that in mind? But I think the rest of the world also need to be somewhat patient with Africa and realize that, you know, Africa's part in this environmental mess that we find ourselves in is quite limited. You know, um, its share of carbon um, uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions is very limited, less than less than five percent. Um, in terms of the carbon budget and what we have got left, you know, most African countries are not going to be able to enjoy that carbon budget because three quarters of it is already used up. Um, but I think even with that in mind, you know, most countries would not want to have to develop and then come back later to clean up, clean, clean after themselves. You know, so now is a time to do things right and doing things right would mean that, you know, the world needs to be, you know, uh, um, patient and indulgent with Africa because these solutions are not going to come overnight. Some of them may need to be tried and tested. Very often infrastructure and the, the skill sets that are needed are not homegrown. Um, so these are, these are um, um, real issues uh, that need to be tackled in as much as we're looking for solutions. You have to talk about how you start um, thinking about homegrown solutions that would support many African countries in that trajectory of going green, you know, of adopting a cleaner pathway. Um, and, and, and bigger vitality, all the words that you've mentioned um, are fundamentally important. I'm interested in 
given the breadth of your education and, and the, what you might call the emotional and intellectual muscles you have cultivated through all of your time and training, what, what you see as the core failing of economics? Right. So, so my my response would be would be slightly measured because I'm I'm coming at it from a non-economic sort of perspective, um, and I can only offer some sort of layman explanation or at least observation. Um, at least from my understanding, I feel that economics have not been very useful in predicting some of these big. Um, sort of global planetary <laughs> um, um, disruptions that we have seen. Um, I mean, this is this this probably was a, a big one to predict or to forecast. But but certainly, when you look at the financial crisis um, that we have seen, um, many of those were not predicted in quite the manner that they have unfolded. So I think that that has sort of um, Maybe uh, I think um, not helped, not helped in terms of um, what might be an antidote um, to these disruptions. So we, we, we haven't been able to prepare or to bounce back in quite the way that you would when you know that something is about to come. So I think that's one. And I think that in that sort of absence of predictions or absence of forecast, I think we, we have been severely tested even in this one because it seems to me that whether it's rich or poor, we simply haven't worked out the right, and, and, and this, like, this is an infrastructure issue. It might be hardware, software, whatever you call it. We, but we simply haven't been able to come up with the right level of preparedness. Um, and another pandemic will happen, and I'm hoping that we will be better prepared. But we simply haven't, both in the financial crisis and in this one, we, we it, it has caught in, it has it has caught us unawares, um, and we haven't been able to prepare um, the dire consequences or even prepare better for the next one. Um, very few countries, I think, have been able to do that, um, and so that's one that I see. Um, just this, this complete absence um, of predictions um, that could then, I think, be accompanied with the level of support mechanisms and, you know, um, thinking people ahead also. Those things, uh, we're, not, we're not able to sort of rely on those things because the prediction was absent. I think the second one for me is, I think we live in increasingly in a society where it's been far too motivated by profit. Um, we measure everything by GDP per capita. Um, and I think that that model of development hasn't really served us because some of the, the fundamental things that matter uh, do not have a monetary value. Um, we are now talking about the sustainable development goals and these 17 goals are you know, strategically important. But many of these goals are very much anchored um, in systems, people, um, and how you make those things come together. They're not necessarily goals that are dependent on monies and, and how monies are rolled out to support. Of course, that's an important part of the equation. Um, but I think that an excessive, um, you know, an ex excessive almost obsession on growth at all cost, um, a capitalist model that really sees profits before people. Um, I think that that has also sort of sent us all off course. You know, the whole system is out of kilter because of the fact that profit seems to be what, what counts. I think even in countries, whether it's Asian countries or African countries, that have been traditionally pro-people, pro, you know, um, living in sort of a communal space, um, that sort of support that you get from, um, you know, working with people, um, fostering these kind of support systems. Um, and drawing from them. I think even in those in those parts of the world, um, there is this sense that the, the, the market and, and the profit 
um, have been these two measurements that are now more or less disrupting these societies, disrupting the social fabric of these societies um, in a way that these things are what matters. Um, and, and the solidarity and, and those things that we have come to count on and rely on are, are generally just sort of ebbing away. So I think those for me um, <clears throat> are, are two potential, not potential, but two, two, two ways that I've seen that economies haven't really, um, you know, the, the, the economic side of things haven't, haven't helped. Um, mm -hmm. it, has, it has actually thrown us off kilter. So in the uprisings related to pandemic, related to this unmasking, related to the death of George Floyd and the hideousness of that eight minutes and 46 seconds, and uh, it, it's become symbolic for another, what you might call dimension of inhumanity uh, related to law enforcement. You can, you can almost feel what I will call the spring coiling inside yeah. of humanity. The, the, in other words, the reaction, the call to action that's forming. And I just say that as a prelude so that you can share with our audience what in the, how do I say in the context of all this dreadfulness, gives you the most hope for the future of humankind and, and society on Earth. What gives me the most hope? Um, I think we as, as people and people of different generations and from different regions of the world um, do have shared values after all, you know. Um, I think even when systems in place, in, systems in place fail us, even when governments fail us, um, even when economies, um, you know, are not aligned to our needs, you know, our value systems, our support systems, um, you know, are, are still intact um, and we can still draw on that. It, it's, an, it's, an, it's a reservoir that never dries up. I think that gives me hope. And that has been manifested um, by um, what, what has happened, um, you know, with, with the murder of um, um, George Floyd. Um, and the way that has been, um, you know, the, the, the sense of indignation that um, we've seen in the rest of the world, the, the, the sense of sorrow, you know, deep sorrow. Um, I, I don't even, you know, I mean, know whether um, the, the family of George Floyd realize, you know, just how powerful in death um, you know the the message that has that has come from all across the world has been you know a message um, for you know um, people to stand together when these injustices you know um, occur and when they occur in the way that that, that we we saw it happen. Um, so I think that gives me hope. It gives me hope that it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter where you come from, but people do recognize injustice. Um, and people do um, have that sort of shared, that we have shared aspirations, you know, we, we have shared values. Um, and that, that I think is, uh, these are prized assets and, and these are things that, 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 that we run on basically. So, so that I think gives me hope. Um, and and, and we, we talk a lot about the ugly side of globalization, but what has happened in the US has actually drawn on that global phenomenon because everywhere George Floyd's name has been mentioned. You know, my children have talked about it and, and talked about the video that they've seen and how 
they can't even bring themselves to watch it. And, and, and they're no exception. So it's been talked about everywhere and by all generations. So that, I think, is what gives me hope. And it, what, it is what gives me hope in the area of work that I am um, I'm in, in natural resources and climate change. We've seen how the whole debate has also been taken up by youth movements and how much they have also, you know, um, decided to speak through to power. Uh, so I think, I think um, the next generation, I think, for me, and, and that's another, and my, my second source of hope is in the generation to come. I feel that, yes, we can, we can try and educate our children, but I feel that they're going to be a lot more resilient than we were. Um, and they will be um, ready to put good to power in, in more ways than we have been. Fatima, I uh, I have how would I say been inspired when I first met you, and I have been inspired by this conversation today. I've referred several times, and I'm really underscoring this for our young listeners about the breadth of your curiosity, training, and education, and how you see. I'll just take a brief tour right now of some phrases, narrative sense, people first, preparedness, unaware, motivated by profit, profit before people, the system is out of kilter. It comes to the quest for aspiration, kindred spirits. As I listen to you, I was compelled to reach out to one of my favorite books. It was a book by a famous woman poet written in 1949 named Muriel Rukeyser. Hmm. It was called The Life of Poetry. And the book talked about an experience that she had had where people could not ingest into their mind and spirit poetry because they were so afraid that poetry in its, what you might call, ethereal form is unsettling. Mm -hmm. But she issued a challenge in that book that I felt like your spirit today issued to this audience that I wanted to quote She said, the relations of poetry are, for our period, very close to the relations of science. It's not a matter of using the results of science, but of seeing that there is a meeting place between all kinds of imagination. Poetry can provide that meeting place. I've attempted to suggest a dynamics of poetry showing that a poem is not its words or its images any more than a symphony is its notes or a river its drops of water. <clears throat> poetry depends on moving relations within itself. It's an art that lives in time, expressing and evoking moving relation between the individual consciousness and the world. The work that a poem does is a transfer of human energy. And I think human energy may be defined as consciousness, the capacity to make change in existing conditions. It appears to me that to accept poetry in these meanings would make it possible for people to use it as an exercise and enjoyment of the possibility of dealing with the meanings in the world and in their lives. Your way of seeing and sharing reminded me of that passage that I read many years ago. And I really, I want to thank you for being our guest today. I want to thank you for what you impart to the audience, for the work you do in your entire professional life and for our global commission. And I look forward to speaking with you in many contexts in the coming months. But I, uh, I, I'm sure my audience will agree. I was very, we were all very invigorated by the way in which you guide us to see 
in this conversation today. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rob. I really enjoyed the conversation and I particularly enjoyed the quotes that you just um, you know, shared with me because I'm, I'm a great believer in poetry. I do write quite a lot of poems myself. Um, so I really did enjoy that. So thank you so Very much. good. And uh, like I said, before too long, we'll, we'll meet again soon. Bye for now. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.